All right, here we are. We're back, and uh, we're going to log in here and uh, take a look at the at the system. It just rebooted. One of the things you want to do is install the package tool. It's going to bootstrap itself. Uh, here you're seeing it uh, download itself and install PKG. That's how you install binary packages on FreeBSD. Um, you can also see that it's updated itself to revision P9 EOS. Here's the main file system. The file system uh, keeps all the system stuff separate from the user stuff. So all the system is under slash etc slash lib slash user. And all the third party apps is under slash user local, which I'll show you in a minute here. See, now you have the different ETC folder. This is for all third party apps. You'll notice here, I sh this is the system ETC folder. And now I'm going to go to the user local ETC folder, and you'll see that it's got very different content. So, uh, and this will populate as I start installing stuff. So I'm going to install a desktop environment here so you can see what, what that would look like. Now, before I do that, I want to show you the file system. Uh, it's very basic here, and I'm going to show you the swap file in a second. Now, FreeBSD has full disk encryption courtesy of the GELI interface, G-E-L-I. It's a kernel level uh, hardened uh, encryption interface. Uh, and one of the things I like to do is to encrypt the swap file. Now, because GELI is built into the kernel, all I have to do is add the ELI extension to the actual physical partition in the FS tab point. And that will tell the operating system to automatically encrypt the swap file on startup. And it'll actually encrypt it with a, a throwaway key, an ephemeral key. So every time you reboot the machine, it, it for all intents and purposes, re-encrypts the swap partition as a, with a new key. So if if you shut once the machine shut down, there's no key that's retained. Uh, so basically what that means is that uh, you can't recover the swap once the machine's been shut off. Now you see because I've already edited rc.com file or the fs tab file, it's looking for the ELI. I'm going to manually specify the, the old partition telling it to remove the swap. And I'm going to do a swap info here so you can see that there's no swap. And now I'm going to add it back with a swap on a, which is going to read the fs tab and add the swap file. Boom, the kernel automatically detected it, loads the encryption, and generates an ephemeral key. So now the virtual memory in the swap file is uh, fully encrypted. And uh, that's automatic. It's one of the neat things about FreeBSD, and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, so uh, earlier I was talking about encryption. Now, one, at this point, one of the things you may decide to do, depending on your philosophy, is either to use full disk encryption, bearing in mind what we talked about in the last video, that it may be possible to actually uh, compare an unencrypted disk against certain folders that we know to be a certain version and, and guess your key easier. Or you can use a home folder type of encryption such as PEFS uh, on FreeBSD, which is a kernel level file encryption tool, very similar to EncryptFS on Linux. Here I'm going to install XFCE desktop uh, with a binary package tool. This is going to take a little bit, so um, we're going to see it run through and do this. So while it's uh, downloading these packages, I'm going to run over to another terminal. I'm going to open up a new TTY, and I'm going to install uh, the ports collection, uh, which the ports is a list of like 28,000 plus uh, software packages that are available for FreeBSD, uh, and they compile. So essentially, if I install the version of a file from packages and I don't like the, the options that that file was built with, I always have the option to go to the ports tree and to manually um, build the software with the options I want. Uh, one of the nice things uh, about that is, is that you can tailor the software. And one of the things I want to show you uh, here real quick with FreeBSD update is the cron option there in the middle. The cron option basically will allow you to update it in your cron tab. Now, I don't have a cron tab created here, but if you did a cron tab dash E and added this to run as a cron job, and you just put instead of fetch install like we did earlier, you would put cron install. 
and it would automatically run at your specified time, plus or minus 300 seconds uh, to make sure that everybody's cron doesn't hit them at the same time. Basically does a 3,600 random value. Um, and, uh, and that allow you to update your system automatically. Uh, you can do the same thing with your, P, with your PKG tool. You can update your packages automatically and you can do the same thing with the porch tree. You can refresh the porch tree automatically as well. Uh, and all that can be done. Um, more or less automated depending on how comfortable you are with possibly having a system that's you know apps get broken if you know a new version doesn't work exactly the way you expect or they change uh, something in a configuration file i'm going to skip ahead here because this is fairly large uh to download and extract these these ports uh it's a fairly large file and um it takes a while. Now, the nice thing about having the ports installed, even if you never intend to compile anything, is that you can use the where is command uh, to find any software. If you know the name or you think you know part of the name of any of the 28,000 pieces of software you might want for FreeBSD, uh, the where is command will allow you to do that. You can see it's still installing XFCE uh, 4 plus all the dependencies. So I'm flipping back and forth here between the uh, TTY1 and TTY2 by using uh, Alt. Alt uh, F1, Alt F2, you can switch back and forth. So it's about ready to start extracting those ports files and that's gonna take a little bit uh, to do so. I'm gonna open up a new TTY while we're waiting. Let's talk a little bit about sysctl. Sysctl replaces the slash proc folder on Linux. And it basically gives you all the information that proc gives you on Linux. Uh, but these are actually live values out of the out of the kernel. And you could actually tweak them by setting values back. So if you want to change like the amount of max open files or uh, the number of file descriptors or uh, um, you know, any of a number of kernel tunable things, you can actually just sysctl space any one of these names equals whatever the new value is, and you can set it on a running kernel. Now, if you want it to be persistent across reboots, you have to put it in the etc sysctl.com file. And there's an example one that's set down there that's that's uh, commented out. But uh, uncommenting that and setting it equal to one would allow, would allow all users to be able to see processes from all users. And here's some of the security related ones that can be set. There's a ton of tuning that can be done. You can see the ports extracting now, and it looks like the uh, packages are almost done. So I'm probably, uh, And you see that even with all the software, it's really not big system. We're only about two gigs and we're installing quite a bit of graphic software. Here you go, it looks like the packages are done. They're giving me some things I might wanna put in my console kit, my policy kit folder files. This is something where PCBSD really shines. Uh, I'm sort of taking you through the grunt work here so you get an appreciation for how a Unix system is built. But uh, if you're lazy or if you just don't want to do this every time, uh, PCBSD is basically a bare bones system like this, with the exception that uh, they do all this stuff for you to get working policy kits. Now you'll notice that how the HAL daemon was installed, I'm trying to run it, it's telling me it's not enabled. So all software that you want to start up daemons has to be, you have to enable it in this file. Everything's controlled from etcrc.com. So right now I'm gonna tell it to allow Dbus and HAL to run. And once this is saved, you'll see when I go back and, and tell it to start, it's not gonna complain anymore. Now you can start these by doing dot slash the file name or service in the file name, either way works. 
and there you go. So now those two services are ready. Um, and at this point, we can probably install the Slim Login Manager. Which will allow us to, uh, you know, have a graphical automatic login. Uh, and of course, I forgot to install Xorg, so let's install the Xorg here. And uh, that'll allow us to, uh, to actually run XFCE. The nice thing about the package manager too is that even though XFCE is a desktop manager, the packages themselves do not require X to run. Uh, you know, they, they have to run inside an X server, but X isn't directly a uh, dependency. So, you know, sometimes in the Ubuntu's and some of the large uh, distributions, you'll have like really weird software that's like a global dependency. Like why does the Fortune software need to be installed for everything depends on it in Ubuntu? Um, you don't get that here. Things are, uh, the dependencies are very much built based on how they're compiled in the runtime. So you get really tight dependencies. And again, this is gonna take a little bit. So I'm probably gonna skip ahead here um, and show you and uh, show you some of the stuff about the ports. So here I wanna find VLC, you see how that works? Where is VLC? It's in our user ports multimedia VLC. Even if you don't wanna compile it, it's a great idea to type where is if you have ports just to see if it's actually available for VSD. Now you'll see here, I can actually uh, show you the config file uh, because the ports and the packages are tied together to a single database. And this is done purposely to make sure that you don't download some packages and install some source and get your whole operating system out of whack. So I'm gonna to have to skip ahead here till these are done. Now I'm gonna pause the video in a bit here uh, so you don't have to see, you know, wait around for 20 minutes while it downloads all this. So uh, we can skip ahead here. Before I do that though, one of the things I like to do, I'm kind of a nitpicker, um, is I like to edit the uh, etc csh.logout file uh, because it irritates me when I log out and the screen doesn't clear. I like a clean uh, terminal when I log out. So I'm gonna log in here and uh, edit this file to clean this up. And you see, we're just gonna add the word clear here. And now when I log out, I got a clean TTY. And uh, that's that's what I like to see. So if I log in again, you'll see the message of the day will pop up, fill the screen with garbage. When I log out, it's clean. That's just another little thing I like to do that um, I'm probably a little bit retentive is with that. And uh, at this point, I'm going to skip ahead here because there's about 130 packages that have to be installed. Uh, so I'll see you when they're when they're done. All right, the packages are installed. I'm going to install the uh, Slim. I'm going to install the uh, the Slim uh, manager. But before that, here's the VLC config file, and the boxes that are checked is what the software comes is what the is the default options. And if you install the binary package, that's what you're going to get. However, if you want an option that's not checked, then you have to build it from source. And uh, the way you would do that is make config, select the options you want. Say you wanted Moose Pack. You would select that option, you would hit OK, and then you would type make install clean, which I'm not going to do because it's going to take, you know, VLC is a massive package. Um, and it takes a little while. However, if you have a fast computer, it's really not all that involved to do this. And then to uninstall, you can type make deinstall uh, underneath the, the, the directory of the application. You can also, if you do a package info, uh, anything you install via ports also shows up as a package because it creates a package and installs it. So you could deinstall it here as well using the package tool. I'm gonna install the Slim Display Manager uh, and enable that. And, uh, and you can see usually when you install a package, it tells you what you need to enable in rc.com. So I'm gonna add that and then the Capture window is going to resize here, so I'm going to um, 
kill the video here.